Hey, everybody. Um, thank you for coming to my talk, and uh, solidarity for all the people suffering jet lag. I, I feel your pain. Um, what I want to chat with you today uh, about is, is research at Riot Games, specifically how we structure our data collection uh, sort of folks and our research team. And we'll look at it specifically through the lens of a project I worked on, the update to Summoner's Rift. But before I start, I should probably talk a little bit about who I am. My name's Austin Harley. I'm a researcher uh, at Riot Games. I've been there for about two years, and I've worked primarily on the update that I'll be talking about today, in addition to um, a lot of competitive motivation within League of Legends. Before that, I worked at a company called Hope Lab, and I did game design and research for games built for adolescents and young adults with chronic diseases. All told, I've been doing this for about six or seven years now, so slowly building a career out of it. Before we dive in further, I should also talk a little bit about Riot Games. We were founded in 2006, although we're more widely known for the game we released in 2009 called League of Legends. And I think this actually sums us up the best, which is we aspire to be the most player-focused game company in the world. And throughout this talk, you're going to hear me say a lot of things like player focus, player impact, player value. And I want to contextualize that now in a phrase that I think sums it up well for, for me which is no matter what experience we create as a game company, our users, our players should walk away from that feeling just awesome. And on a personal note, when it comes to research, it means that we should be endeavoring with every research project to make sure that their voice is heard and, and impacts development. So for those of you who haven't played the game, I should talk a little bit about League of Legends as well. Um, League of Legends is a MOBA. Um, which is a multiplayer online battle arena. You play the role of a champion, maybe one of the ones here, on a team with four other people all playing champions of their own. So your team might look something like this. And if we pull it out a little bit, you play on a map that also looks something like this. You play the role of the, the team down here on the bottom. Your goal is, is kind of to go up there to the top and, and kill the nexus up there, but those guys aren't really keen on that, so they're going to try and stop you and actually uh, kill your nexus as well. Uh, the mechanics of the game are a little bit complex. I don't want to go into too much detail, but if you played a real-time strategy game, it's a lot like that. Um, all told, it ends up being this interesting mix of PvP and, and cooperative play at the same time in about a 30 to 40 minute game window. But it kind of undersells it, really. Behind every game, the way we think about it is there is there are these players, right? And probably not in costume, but you get the idea. It, every game played is, is somebody who's passionate about the game and has, has been gracious enough to really donate their time and play with us. So enough backstory. Let's dive into research. Uh, research is pretty powerful, right? Um, if any of you have ever been in a situation where you've gotten to run a user experience lab and you've brought somebody in and showed them an in-game menu or store for the first time, you've probably seen this interesting experience where they get stuck on the thing we just never thought of. And that's awesome. Not because we want them to be super frustrated, but because that's something that never got out to the hundreds or thousands or millions of other players in the world and disrupted their experience. I mean, we're all sitting right here now having a conference about games user research, so I think it's great that we can get together and have this kind of impact. But at the same time, you know, it's not all rainbows and cupcakes, right? Like, research has issues, and one of the ones that I think we're suffering from right now is we can be disconnected from the development process. It's like there's a wall between us and development teams sometimes. And the way this often looks is, is a development team will reach out to you with some kind of request, and I throw it over this wall, and then, and then we, we you know, stack rank that and, and pull one out and, and we send something back over, but we don't necessarily know what happened in the course of that. Do, what kind of impact did that have? And so this is really top of mind for us at Riot and, and particularly in our insights department. And we really think there's a better way to, to do research and to structure your teams. And so the rest of my talk is really gonna focus on that. And I also want to acknowledge that this is a conversation. This is not us telling you what the best approach is. You guys know your organization better than we do. So at the end, I, I want to talk a little bit about considerations that you want to take into account before choosing sort of an embed approach. So to give a little bit more context, I should talk about insights and, and what our discipline is. Uh, it, it's a co collection of sub-disciplines, research being one of them. Um, I don't want to go into a lot of detail here. I think much like Riot, we're fairly well summed up by our mission, which is 
we empower writers to make player-informed decisions by translating data into actionable insights, providing a framework for understanding and representing the voice of the player. That's like a mouthful, but really what I would take away from this is the last one, representing the voice of the player. It's, it's kind of what we're all about, no matter what discipline uh, of data collection we use. And on a, on a functional level, our philosophy is really what guides us. And, and it, it breaks down into some of these four parts, right? One, we all have the same goals. We want to paint a better picture of the world for our developers. We just use different tools, and different tools are, are better for different problems. And when we have that, that player voice, we want to inform development with it, not drive it. Our goal is not to ever tell a, res or I should say a developer what to do. They are very smart people. We hired them for a reason. They come with years of experience in art and game design. We just want to paint a better picture for them and make sure the player voice is heard in the equation so they can make the best decision possible. Additionally, we believe in a multimodal approach, which is we've got all these folks under one umbrella. We should be leveraging all of these different tools. It's really powerful to know from analytics what happened in your game. It's also very powerful to know from the research side why a player might have done something. It's much more powerful when you combine those stories together, especially when you think about what you might do in the future. And lastly, and where we'll spend most of time today, we embed our team members. To really describe this, though, I think um, we should look at a visual representation of what a non-embedded and embedded model look like. So this is what the centralized model looks like, kind of like I described earlier um, in the presentation. You've got your product teams over here on the left with, with requests of various kinds. This might be a game design team. This might be a, a, a map update team. And they send a request over. And our, our insights team or your research team says, OK, I've got all these things coming in. I'm going to pull this one, this one, this one, because these are high priority, and I'm going to do them. And then we send a report back. And this can be really powerful for some, for some problems. And in fact, we still have a central insights department. It's really good if you've got a situation where you've got a problem that spans your organization or, or will affect multiple development teams. But you also run into issues of, of context, lacking a full understanding of, of when this came in the development process, or ultimately, what happens with the data afterwards. And not to mention, there's cost to switching context constantly. If you are somebody pulling three or four different requests from like three or four different teams, you've got to be a subject matter in those areas, kind of, right? So let's look at embedding and what we choose to do more often. And the way this looks is we sit with the team. It's, it's actually pretty simple. We just become a team member, like an artist or, or an engineer or a design lead. We work with them day in, day out. And this has a lot of benefits ranging from deep context to being able to follow the data through. But, but really, to dig into this, we should look into an actual tangible study. So I want to I wanna move into the project that I worked on, the update to Summoner's Rift. I also want to take a drink. I'm going to do that. So what is Summoner's Rift? Well, it's the main map in our game. Um, it's where the majority of players spend their time. It contains all the game rules, the background art and visuals. Uh, it contains all these creatures that you run around and hunt mercilessly when you're not out mercilessly hunting other players. But really, that kind of undersells it. Um, for most players, this is the game. Right, this is where nearly everybody spends their time. If we have an eSports event, this is where it's played. So when we talk about making a change to this map, we're basically talking about making a change to all of our players, or, or a change that's going to affect all of our players. And when I talk about update, what I mean is a complete visual overhaul. And, and this slide is a little compressed, but I hope you can get the sense of how different these two art styles are from one another. It's not a minor texture update. It's not us cleaning up lines. It's re-envisioning the style of our map so that it moves us, hopefully, into the modern MOBA genre while maintaining things like performance and clarity and, and ultimately increasing visual fidelity. And with the change of this magnitude and uh, that's going to affect so many players, we kind of had an interesting decision on our hands. And I, I want to call out something, which is that as much as embedding is a, a structure choice for your organization, it's also a prioritization choice. Because at this point in time, we could have said, we want a researcher spending their time working on three or four different things to, to some degree of ability, probably pretty well. Or we could have one person just doing their best to kick as much ass as possible on this one project that's really high priority. And ultimately, we chose to embed. And the reason I want to call this out is because whether you're a research team of one or like 1,000, this is still a choice that is, it is in your purview. And it's really what's right for your organization at the time. So what does embedding actually do for us? 
Well, at a high level, it builds trust. Um, pretty simply, uh, it gives you tons and tons of opportunities to sit down with your team and have relationships and conversations in a way that's really, really valuable. And you're gonna hear this throughout, so I just wanted to call that theme out. On the ground, it looks like sitting down and talking with an artist about why you chose the art style that you chose and, and, and how research could maybe help understand if we're meeting the goals of the team in terms of that style. It, it is swirling your chair over and talking to the project lead about what the development cycle looks like and, hey, how could the next research study fit into this? Or it might not have anything to do with work. It might just be like normal ass conversations with coworkers that build friendships and relationships, the kind of thing that, that brings, brings bonds with the team. And of course, we play a lot of games together, not just League, right, anything. We play Heroes of the Storm, we play Hearthstone and watch other people and laugh at their stupid face hunter decks, right? The, the idea being that playing together in many ways really brings a team together. So I think we can get all on board with the idea that the trust is good, that's probably not a hard sell, but on sort of a functional level, what does it really do for you? Well, I look at it kind of like this. When you first embed on a team, you start off as an outsider. And then ultimately, as you start to build trust with the team, you can include them in the research process and build trust in that process. And this gets you to a space where they're, they're more willing to listen. And that's really valuable, especially if you ever tried to sit with a development team and, and get them on board with research. Once you've built up that bank of trust, you can start asking for the things you need. We have requests that often go beyond what developers plan for, and it's important for us to get that help to do our job. And then lastly, you get to this space where it's no longer the development team, and the research team, it's just us working together. And that's when you can solve the biggest, the biggest problems and have the most powerful impact. So let's dive into each of these points, minus the outsider one. We'll say we're past that. So the first is that embedding builds trust in research. And the way that it does this is those ample opportunities to really include developers in the process, ask them what questions they have that are most relevant. Um, learn why we've chosen the particular goals that we have, explain to them the methodologies, get their thoughts on what the research data that's coming back says. And the reason we care about this is because you can do the best research in the world and it will not matter if that person does not trust you and is not willing to listen to you. So I ran into a, a, a tangible example of this when I was working on this team. When I first started, we had really collected no research, kind of obviously, and we wanted to get a baseline sense of how players felt about the previous map and how players felt about the update in progress. And that meant focus groups in this particular circumstance. We brought players in, asked them some questions, showed them still, light, or still footage and, and video footage of, of the map in progress and, and got some valuable data. We learned that the previous map felt pretty warm and inviting and the colors are a little washed out here but hopefully you can get the sense. The previous map felt warm and inviting and, um, and that, was, that was cool to know. And, and the update in progress actually was resonating in terms of art style. It felt more like an actual place, um, which is cool, because this is like a wolf camp, and wolves might actually live in the one on the right, whereas it's like a house on the left with a fire. So I don't, I don't know why wolves live there, but whatever. The idea being that, that it felt more like an actual place. And we also learned, interestingly enough, that the ground planed around uh, some of these areas, or, or actually, we only had video footage of this, and so it was kind of a holistic impression that it felt darker, um, colder, and that was a little disconnected from the original map. And so as I, I gave this feedback, I thought this is really valuable, this will help us get a sense of where we should progress. But I noticed that a number of the team members were actually kind of dismissive, specifically some artists of, of this feedback, and that's, that's not good, right? Like that's a space where they're less likely to really incorporate this thinking into design. But I'd been embedding, and so I had a chance to build rapport with some of these folks, and I went up and chatted with one artist, and he told me an interesting story. He told me about, when he was working at a previous company, he produced a lot of art with his team, and this was art they thought was good for the direction of the game. However, at some point in the process, an external stakeholder would come along and said, hey, you need to focus group test this, right? And that's not a bad instinct, but the problem was is that was about the extent of his involvement in that process. Until, of course, the results came back, and it turned out that that direction was not going to work for them anymore. So this, this, kind of, this kind of sucks, because regardless of whether that choice was good for the ultimate product and, and what players want, the way that this, this artist was treated in the process by research was, was really shitty, right? From his perspective, it was like an external force came along and said, you can't do this. And research is, is not meant to do that, right? We're meant to inform the process and help them make a better decision. 
so I got it, right? Like I got the distrust and, and luckily though, I, I was embedded and I had a chance to sit down with these people and start including them more in the process. And things really came full circle later on in the project when one of those same artists came up to me um, and ask questions about this. This is actually concept footage, but in our map, we have four, four sort of different quadrants, each with their own feel. And they were genuinely curious about whether that feel was coming across, whether it was too strong, or, or whether it felt like four continents had just been slammed together and it was weird. And that was the space where I'm like, okay, okay, we're getting there, right? Like, they're at least willing to listen and kind of trust what's going on in the research. And so this is a valuable place to be. At the very least, your, your developers are willing to listen. But I think we, we can go further with it. And so the next thing it allows is it really encourages the team to help us get what we need for research. As you build up this bank of trust, you can start asking for various resources in, in a way that they're going to be more amenable to giving. And it, you know, if I'm honest, right, if we need a prototype, that comes from somewhere. If we need stimuli for focus groups, that comes from somewhere. It usually comes from the development team. And it's a much easier ask if they're on board with what you're doing, if they realize you're all aligned around the same shared goal. So the experience I had with this was after we run these focus groups, we, we were like, okay, that's great. That's a good high touch sort of understanding of what's going on, but we really need a more granular read on the various parts of the map. And that meant play testing. But our games also played in multiple regions, so that meant international play testing. And while that's all well and good, we didn't really have a robust process for doing this. We'd done some testing, but nothing on this level, and nothing really that included um, the new art tech that we had. So that meant we were going, well, I was getting a lot of help, right? Like developing a new process and getting all these resources. And to give a sense of that, right, the resources involved are like, you need a build engineer to get you a, a build that'll work and be streamlined in other regions. You need a release guy to, to help you figure out how to get it there. You need quality assurance so, so once it gets there, we can make sure it works and doesn't just crash and burn. You have to have artists to help you block out distracting parts of the map, parts that players might give feedback on, but you're not really ready for feedback there because it's obviously super work in progress to you, but maybe not to them. And of course, regional researchers who speak the language, because I don't, and they can help you collect the data. And these are not small asks. And in some cases, like for instance, the build engineer case, that's, that's something they hadn't planned to have for months, a build working in another region. Or in the case of an artist, that's, that's throwaway work, right? Like that's stuff, that's time that they could be spending on, on furthering the, the final product. So I was embedded though, and, and that, that got us to a place where they were at least willing to trust and, and that I was on, on the same page as them and, and willing to donate their time and effort. But I also wanna take a step back to, to talk about the counterpoint to this, which is that no, you don't absolutely need embedding to get to this space. You can still get resource without this, but it runs risks. You run, you run sort of the risk of becoming this guy, right? Like the external stakeholder who, who comes along and says, look, this research guy needs what he needs. You're going to do this. And kind of like in the example I mentioned earlier, you run the risk of players, or I should say developers, not really being on board with the results, not really incorporating them, or, and being distrustful of research in the future, such that when you come for future projects to them, they're like, oh, no, no, no. No, I, I know what that was like. Luckily, again, though, through embedding, this wasn't a problem that we had to deal with. And, and again, we got into a good space through this bank of trust that was built up. But really, where we want to get to, and, and where I think we ultimately got to, was this place. Where embedding lets us be really, really powerful together and lets us solve the biggest problems. And what this looks like is, is again, no longer me as researcher and you as developer or artist. It's just us working together. You've built up a lot of trust in what I do and see the value that I bring, and vice versa. I see all the value that the team brings, and we're just aligned. This is really valuable for a number of reasons, and I'm going to go into a couple. The first is uh, deep context, right? I am not an artist. I'm going to show you an example of how not an artist I am. This is, this is, this is my best possible self-portrait. And when it comes to asking about art, right, it's, it's not that I'm completely clueless, but Getting the deep context from somebody who's been doing this for 10 years lets me ask much more valuable and powerful questions. But even more than that, it lets us have really collaborative discussion after the fact on what to do with this data. Like, what do, we, what do the players actually mean in this sense, and how does this impact development? And so I want to walk through two, two short examples of where I saw this on the project really come to life in a good way. 
And the first involved our creature team. So our creature team was actually pretty happy with the various creatures on the map. We've got our, our red buff here, looks kind of like a crazy tree elemental. Our, our dragon who lands and screams at you in sort of an angry way. Baron, the strongest monster on our map. And then there were these guys, vultures. They didn't actually look exactly like that, but you get the idea. And they were a little concerned about vultures because there was, there was a problem with their flying animation. It, it felt unclear and they were concerned that players would not be able to regularly and effectively target them in a fight. So as we were running these play tests that I mentioned, we kind of wanted to get a, a more granular read on how they felt about each of the creatures, but especially, especially the vultures. And by and large, we found out that, that the creature team was right, um, which is kind of a cool finding. That's not always the case, but players loved red buff. It felt strong. Players thought dragon, I, I've never heard people say badass that much in a study. Um, and, and Baron felt appropriately strong for his place, the strongest monster on the map. But when it came to vultures, we got some pretty funny feedback. We, we had learned that uh, players were consistently saying, yeah, bro, you got birds, right? Like, wh what's going on? You've got crazy lizard over here, this, this scary dragon, this tree elemental, and super normal birds just hanging out in a nest. So that was kind of disconnected, I mean, pretty obvious. But really what was, what was cool about that was the discussion afterwards. It was sitting down and understanding what do we do with that data, right? Do, I mean, there's a lot of possible options. Maybe, maybe what we do is, is we magic up these birds. We create some magical vultures that meet player expectations. Or maybe we completely revamp them in such a way that we get a new creature that's more resonant. After all, players were saying that they, they didn't match very well and on top of that, clarity issues. Or maybe we choose to do nothing at all. Maybe our effort is better spent leveling up other parts of the map. After all, additional context is that it's not like players were saying they hated these things. They were just saying, yeah, they don't fit, but it's not gonna make me stop playing the game. Each of those is potentially a viable choice given the team, and it was, a, it was one that was informed by data, which is, which is the most important part. We could make sure the player voice was heard. And ultimately, what we ended up doing was, was completely scrapping them and, and replacing them with razor beaks, ground birds, but you know, at least kind of magical and looks a little scary. And they resonated better. Players were on, more on board with those and we, we dealt with some of the clarity issues. So I think this was a big win for players. The next example, interestingly enough, involves feedback we got about the original map while asking about the update in progress. And it's, it's a little bit hard to see, but up here you can see this kind of glowy, glowy thing at the top. Um, I'll blow it up for you. Um, this is a ghost of a character in our game. And if any of you have been playing for many years, you, you might actually recognize this character in this situation. But this, this only happened during an in-game event for a very small period of time, but we were consistently hearing players call out feedback about situations like this, uh, ghosts popping up now and again, or ants crawling on the ground, these small dynamic elements um, that were animated. And, and the theme that was coming out was that it felt like the map had a life to it. And this was really cool because because again, the after discussions, I, I remember giving this, this feedback to the team and watching a couple of the animators' eyes light up at this. And, and so I followed up with them afterwards and, and they were like, yeah, you know, we actually had kind of a similar idea, not the exact same thing, but this notion of can we apply animation to a part of the map that has nothing to do with the creatures that you fight regularly, just non-gameplay space. And so I gave them more context on what was going on and they came up with a really cool idea that, that wasn't one that the players had, it was just sort of a theme, right? And that, that idea was to build out this, this living world through small creatures and they, they pitched us to the team and ultimately it was decided, yeah, we should pursue this. And so we get little things like, like this owl that just pop up now and again on the map but give the place a sense of life, like there's something living here. Or if you happen to scroll the top left corner of the map at just the right time, you actually see the dragon that is otherwise you only see when you're fighting, fly by. Again, this sense of an actual place that somebody lives. And this was really cool again because, you know, my hope is that just like with the previous map, players going forward, you know, years from now are gonna call up these small elements. And I also wanna take a step back to, to mention something, which is that it's not like these conversations I had were like scheduled like, hey guys, let's get in the room and talk about exactly what this means. Oftentimes it was more like an, an ad hoc conversation, one that started by somebody across the room talking about something that I could hear and be like, oh, hey, research, right? Like that thing we found, that's actually relevant to this. Or just somebody walking over to me and chatting with me about this. Because as, as stupid as it sounds, email and having to walk across the building 
to another team is a strangely high barrier for human beings. Um, but again, being embedded allows this much more collaborative space where these kinds of conversations can happen. So taken in sum, I, I know I've only provided just a, a small set of examples, but, oops, but really, you know, it's sort of a more, or I should say it's, it's the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. There were a lot of little cases like this that led up to us ultimately delivering a map, I think, that, that had a much better feel um, from, the original, from the original update itself. Um, it, it more aligned with what players thought the original Summer's Rift was while still having a different art style. We got really badass creatures that players were resonant with and a living world that players have actually made a, a ton of fan-made content about and created life stories for one of the frogs that jumps off and commits suicide, so that's kind of random. But the point being, there was a lot of value delivered by incorporating the voice of the player. So to really sum up the embed value, um, I want to revisit this slide, which is you start off as an outsider, but by working with the team, you build up trust. And when you build up that trust, you can involve them in the research process and get them to a space where they're more likely to listen. You can also use that trust to help you get the help you need in order to do effective research and answer questions you couldn't otherwise. And then finally, you get to the stage where it's everybody collaborating together in a really positive way where the player voice is heard. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I, I don't want this to be completely one way. I, I want to provide you guys with, with the counterpoints to this, which is that embedding is a choice, and there are costs associated with it. So let's talk about those now. First is that you're necessarily narrowing your viewpoint when you embed on a team. You get this more like trees for the forest kind of viewpoint, and it becomes harder to understand at a high level prioritization across the organization. So that brings me to my next point, which is if you want to make sure that you're all sort of still embedded or working on the most relevant projects at a time, you're going to want somebody playing that role. And that's what we did. When I was on this project, actually, we were a research team of four, and all of us were embedded on various, various teams. But one of our members played sort of a half-on, half-off role, maintained relationships, and sort of made sure that we were all embedded where we needed to be um, in order to be as effective given company priorities. The next point is that your managers are going to be distanced from the tactical work that a direct report is doing. Really, there's a lot of trust involved with doing this. The person who goes onto that team functions as kind of an autonomous entity, somebody who just figures out what the team's needs are and, and executes. It's up to them to ask for help for managers or from other people who, who might know better. And it's up to the, or I should say, it's, it's up to the manager to trust that they're going to reach out for help. This can be a risk if you have a particularly junior team or you're trying to embed somebody in a problem space that they're really unfamiliar with or is going to require a methodology that they've never done. You need to make sure they're going to reach out or that you have confidence they can operate in that autonomous fashion. And lastly, and one that we're dealing with a lot right now, which is maintaining team cohesion. When you embed, you, you kind of assume the identity of the team that you're with, and that's a good thing, but it can also be challenging to maintain your research team identity as well, which is, which is also very valuable. And this is one we don't have a solution to yet, though I am confident we'll get to a good space with it. So what I would leave you with is this. Embedding can be really valuable and really powerful, but no matter what the approach is, no matter what, what goals your organization have at this point, the thing that delivers the most player value is what you should be choosing. That's it. Thanks, everybody. Questions? Hello. Hello. Oh, okay. Hello, friend. <laughs> um, uh, data scientist at uh, 505. I couldn't agree more with the different step you have mentioned, where you first need to integrate to the team, mm -hmm. and the development team really look at you at the beginning, uh, like you are coming from another planet, if they are not used to work uh, with those methods. And I was wondering, once you have reached this state of you are fully integrated to the team, how does your everyday work look like? I mean, from where uh, comes your orders? Is it still like, super cooperative, where sometimes you just choose yourself your topics of study, or so sometimes it comes from the development team, um, or is it like someone uh, who has a wish from the manage management? What is, you know, the, your task repartitions come from? Yeah, no, actually, um, that's a really good question, and, and to repeat it, I believe it's how do, you, how do you sort of choose what you do on a regular basis kind of thing when you're working with a team? How do you know, how do you do your own prioritization in that space? 
So that, that brings me back to the autonomous point, which is we choose for ourselves. If, if we need help, we talk to our managers, hands down. Um, and that means that we are sort of constantly dealing with prioritization and, and potentially task overload in such a way that we need to be really diligent and constantly leveling up how we choose effectively. We're pretty big on understanding um, something actually that, that I think Jonathan mentioned earlier that's valuable is, is data that's going to be actionable. So in every question, when we make a decision on whether or not we should pursue this particular research path, it's, it's usually aimed at whatever the project goals are and, and can the data we collect be actionable. So that's kind of a guiding light for it, but ultimately each person has their own way of really determining that prioritization. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Uh, hi, mm, I was also part of the process where the actually uh, data analytics team was being built mm -hmm. inside a studio and uh, actually it converged into something you've said and uh, but the split uh, I've experienced was that um, a single analyst was uh, two or three days a week uh, within the team and two days, uh, he was with, uh, uh, three days uh, he was with the project team, and two days he, uh, he was with analytics team. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, mm, this uh, this mm, this achieved the level of embeddedness. So mm -hmm. he was still part of the original project, but uh, still it had to be maintained uh, some priorities and education and uh, alignment within the analytics team. So um, what is your split or what are your experiences in this way? I'm, I'm actually are you full time super... uh, with the team. Are you like full time with the mm -hmm. uh, with the project and zero time with the uh, organization unit, or what is your split? Thank you. Yeah, I'm actually super glad you brought that up because I feel like one of the artifacts of presenting is it can seem very black and white, even if we try and and give a nuanced view. Embedding can be a continuum, right? Much as I said that 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 we had our research manager was kind of 50% in, 50% out, um, looking at prioritization. Um, when we embed. To be frank, there's like an infinite amount of research work at a company. Like you can study all the things, and there's requests coming in from all over the place. So if your project team is in a space wherein you don't need to spend 100% of your time, then very often we will actually pull out and do ad hoc requests. And and I would say actually that's more the case than not. It's very rare that somebody is doing nothing but one team's work. I would say I was about. 80-20 on this, 80% on Summoner's Rift update and 20% doing other tasks, especially because this was my first project at the team, so I had a lot of learning to do about just the company as a whole, but I still sort of 10% supported another team that had no other support. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Any other questions? Hello. Thank you. Thanks. Hi there. Oh, hello. Um, two questions, sorry. Uh, sure. Feel no free worries. to answer both on either. So you essentially you're, you seem to imply that there, there isn't enough researchers to go within Riot to, to do all the research you need to do. At what point do you start saying, okay, there's enough researchers, you know, you have enough, spread your time sufficiently, do the research, because obviously it's like a, it's like a gas, it will fill yeah. whatever space you've got. And then the second one is, um, I was going to ask the question, but you've already semi-answered it, which is how do you ensure that the, the research team have enough time and enough space to communicate within themselves if they're spread across the company as a whole? Yeah, so the first question, I, I don't know that I'm fully equipped to answer, honestly. And it, we sort of have a target internally, which I, I don't think I can actually talk about, but it is, it is probably based on the guiding light that we feel like we can support all the major priorities within the company. And that number is gonna vary a lot by company. And I know it's kind of a vague answer, but really that's kind of what it comes down to, sort of on a nuanced basis. Um, I, I was serious though, it does feel like there's an infinite number of things that you could be doing to the point where I, I wish I had like 24 more hours, um, but that's also probably unhealthy, so I'm gonna try not to do that. Um, your second question, can you repeat it actually? Yeah, sorry. Um, how do you try and maintain this cohesion? So you're saying one of the, one of the issues of embedding is that cohesion becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. um, so how, what kind of processes do you guys go through? Is so I can talk about what we're spinning out now. One of, 
One of the initiatives is we've actually got somebody who's pulling more to a centralized role, and this is, this is where that central role can be really valuable. And they're focusing on how we can kind of level up the research discipline. And one of the byproducts of that have been actually tips and tricks classes within our space that we both need, re like these are classes that are actually run by researchers who go and either bring relevant experience from previous work or learn up on something like factor analysis or, or hardcore stats or whatever. And then we all get together as a team and learn from that. Um, so that's one way. It, it gives us meaningful touch points beyond just, hey, let's go out and have a party. Not that that's not valuable, but you can only have so many parties in a given week. Um, so that's one way we're tackling it. I, I actually don't know what else is in the pipeline right now. It's, it's kind of Betsy's, Betsy's realm at the moment, but I'm sure we'll, we'll dig in and find other things. Games. Games are another really big one. If you can find a way to play games together, which we're bad at at research, but if you can do that, that's a really good way to maintain cohesion. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Oh, in the back? Me. Yeah, an announcement, and uh, you already said that you don't have a perfect solution, but I was wondering if you have like, any thought on the fact that once you're embedded, uh, and uh, I completely understand the fact that uh, a lot more comes out of uh, natural discussion mm -hmm. uh, than pre-planned meeting and professional uh, relationship, but there's still... Um, if you want your advi the, the advice and the data the, from the test to be unthreatening, uh, you need it to be um, objective. There's a problem here. Do you do whatever you want with it? If you're in the discussion, you will talk about what you, what you think about the game, what you, like more personal feeling. How do you maintain, maintain both of those? How do, how do you not appear too cold with, mm -hmm. uh, in a natural discussion? And how do you stay on your side of the professional? Uh, is, is your question about objectivity, f like of your personal opinion versus what we're hearing from yeah, the players? Yeah, per perception from the other people. Because if you're, if you're discussing and giving ideas to play, to, how do you make sure that this, this is the objective recommendation and this is just both of us discussing about the game? Yeah, the lines just really blur when push comes to shove. I mean, obviously, when it comes to the report itself, we, we try and make available in a distilled way what players said. And, and actually, we also fully make available all the video footage. So if anybody wants to sit down and look through, they can. And in that space, um, it, it's obviously valuable because some, some developers are fairly research-minded, and they will go through, and they will look at your video footage. In fact, we encourage them to. So that helps provide part of the equation in terms of, of when our opinion comes in versus when that separates. A lot of the research findings like and sort of our recommendations are us doing what we do as researchers, which is players said this, this is what we believe it means. And then we talk with developers, what are your interpretations? Especially, and this is another, another space where that deep contextual knowledge really can come in because that conversation can spark a lot of things that they might not have thought of, but they are fully equipped to do. Just you kind of need that spark of some other perspective. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's it's kind of both, right? Okay. Other questions? Hi. Hello. So um, yeah, I guess my question is so. Sorry, I'm Deborah. I used to work for <laughs> Ubisoft, and uh, I'm now working at a company called Public Eye, so software company. We're doing webcasting, not related to video games, but we do work in this way that um, we create what we call a triad. So we work with one UX person, one developer, and one project person, mm -hmm. basically, and. Like, obviously, as the UX person, you're going to defend uh, your point of view or the player's uh, or user's point of view. Uh, the developer is going to defend the technical side of things, and the project owner has this business mm -hmm. thing he has to deal with. And at the end, I mean, who makes the decisions? Because obviously, you sometimes you're going to disagree, and sometimes it's really hard to find an agreement. So who makes the decisions, because for us, like what we found out is having a moderator uh, into the team that has a neutral um, role really help, but how do you do that? 
Yeah, so there's, there's two ways that I would answer that. One is that at our company, communication ability is incredibly important for a researcher. Um, this helps us obviously diffuse potentially, um, well, situations where a designer feels that their product is a snowflake, right? And, and sometimes they're right. It is a unique snowflake and it's awesome and it is worth the cost of, of some disruption um, to get us out of like this local maximum or limited space. But it is important for us throughout that process to manage how we communicate and be respectful. So that helps us get part of it. To the, the more direct question of who makes the decision, um, it varies from project team um, and depending on their structure, but a lot of the time it's whoever the project owner is. They are the vision setter, and ultimately we usually build close relationships with them. I mean, we build close relationships with the entire team, but also with, with, um, with the project owner. And this kind of gets to another point that I didn't really have time to talk about in the talk, but in that sort of us space, what research likes to do is is effectively become a trusted advisor. Like we want to be the people who are close to the data and have that unique perspective and can be relied upon to help them address any question. And sometimes those questions are, are very driven by player, player research, right? Like, you know, this is where this data is coming from. And other times it's just using our critical thinking skills and helping them think through. But at the end of the day, it, it's oftentimes that product owner's decision. I think um, League of Legends is specifically interesting because you have a lot of international players and I guess it's quite famous for the fact that there are a lot of like Korean, Japanese players. Mm -hmm. um, have you had instances where the research you did um, had completely different results in Asia and the rest of the world? <laughs> I think somebody else brought this up earlier. Uh, yeah, man, the regional, the regional responses. Um, this is something that, yes, we definitely have, um, especially in terms, I, I actually don't know how much I can say, so I need to tread carefully in terms of, of what research we can result. But what I can say is that there have definitely been differing results between NA, sorry, North America and Asia, like Asian regions especially. We find that North America and Europe tend to trend closer together, but even then there's nuances. And so we've had to be really, really diligent about whatever problem space we're dealing with seeing if, based on a lot of our gut, that, that we think there could be a divide in terms of opinion. Um, on a more sort of tactical level, one of the problems that we consistently have to take into account is, is there any kind of just natural response bias and where does that come from? Is it cultural in nature? Is, is, is it not? Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's sort of a constant, a constant struggle. But there's definitely difference. There's definitely difference between regions. So how do you resolve that? Is, is is that a team discussion? Like, Yeah, absolutely. Um, basically, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you can do it. Depending on your player base, obviously, you can weight your data in certain ways. Um, that's risky. It, it, has a, it has the risk of marginalizing a certain part of the population and not making their voices heard. Um, but other ways are just, you know, where, where is a thing going to have the most impact? Sometimes the products that we're developing are actually more targeted towards certain regions because those regions have specific needs. So in those cases, it's fairly clear. Like, we need to really listen to what's going on there. And while it's, and maybe what we want to know is like, this is not going to destroy other regions. They're not going to hate it. And this region's really going to love it. And that's, that's player value holistically, if that makes sense. Um, but it is kind of a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No worries. Thanks, everybody.